Hello, and thank you for tuning into Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Dong Chen, Chair of the Division of Hematopathology within the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. Dr. Chen is also the Vice Chair of Practice within our department here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Chen specializes in inherited platelet disorders and esoteric laboratory testing of hematologic diseases. So we're very excited to have him on the podcast today to talk about some of these rare diseases and how laboratory tests are critical for diagnosing and treating patients. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Dr. Pritt, for your kind introduction. Uh, really, uh, Thank you for inviting me because uh, rare disease is so rare and uh, we'd love yeah. to share our experience uh, with you and audience. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to talking to you about this and maybe I'll start with um, a, a straightforward first question. Can you give some background to our listeners about hereditary platelet disorders, how they're characterized, how they impact patients and how prevalent they are? Excellent. Um, Rare platelet disorder or inherited platelet disorder is uh, considered to be rare, but may not be too rare. They representing patients with unexplained bleeding disorders and sometimes uh, during surgery or trauma. And then, as we know that platelet has a critical role in primary hemostasis. What do I mean by that is the platelet is actually a very tiny cell fragment. So their job is to surveil the uh, blood vessel wall so when there's a damage, they bind to the subendothelial collagen and then initiate initial platelet aggregates to stop the bleeding or form a platelet plug. So as you can imagine that if something wrong with them, uh, the patient won't be able to form that initial plug to stop bleeding. And the patient's symptom can be that uh, very extended bleeding after surgery or actually uh, mucocutaneous bleeding, meaning skin bleeding or uh, tooth bleeding. And, uh, and sometimes the patient might experience GI bleeding, which actually can cause many uh, issues for the patient. So uh, this is actually a, a, a rare disease. Uh, we consider the prevalence uh, so far right now, we consider is probably for the inherited platelet disorder is about, uh, I would say, the defined one, uh, such as fermansky pulak syndrome, wiskott altry syndrome, Chadia-Higashi syndrome, Jacobson, Parachuso syndrome, there are about one per million kind of a prevalence. But in general, the inherited platelet disorder is somewhat underdiagnosed, and their prevalence can be very high. Recent publications have shown that their prevalence can be as high as 0.1 to 0.01%. Many patients might not experience bleeding until they are uh, hematologically challenged during surgery or trauma. Well, thanks, Dr. Chen. I always thought platelets were so fascinating, these little fragments of cells that play such an important role. And of course, I remember learning about all of those rare platelet disorders with Scott Aldridge, et cetera. Uh, it's very interesting to hear that some of these platelet disorders may be more common than we think. So that gets to the role of testing and how laboratory testing is important for patient care. So how are these diagnoses or these disorders uh, diagnosed through laboratory tests? Um, yes, so basically uh, we start with a clinical um, eva evaluation. So basically uh, when we diagnose uh, platelet disorder, we take three steps. Number one is uh, we need help from the patient, meaning we need to collect bleeding history patient's family history, and also um, uh, uh, patient's other kind of the uh, symptoms, like the uh, eye, and then which is uh, very important to evaluate hermansky pudlak syndrome because of their ocular albinism. Second piece is uh, uh, laboratory testing. The laboratory testing include the routine testing and also sometimes the esoteric testing. In the routine testing, we have a CBC peripheral smear review and in the uh, uh, esoteric testing, we have platelet electron microscopy study and the flow cytometry. So today uh, uh, we're focusing on the platelet transmission electron uh, microscopy. 
basically because the platelet is so tiny, we have to use some uh, 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 a bigger way, a better way, such as uh, EM or electron microscopy to see the, in, uh, the structure of the platelet to diagnose rare platelet disorders. And after the laboratory testing, we collect all of the clinical phenotype and the laboratory phenotype, and then we move into the genetic testing. Uh, try to really uh, hone in on the mechanisms of disease and also gene mutations. Because knowing the gene mutation can serve in two purposes. One is to confirm the diagnosis that can rendered by, let's say, platelet EM uh, or other method. Second one is we may be able to predict patient's outcome because bleeding is one uh, more body, uh, uh, morbidity of the patients, but also potential other issues like uh, uh, other disease related to platelet disorder, such as uh, hematologic neoplasm in the future. So those can be also evaluated. So as you can see, platelet uh, electron micro microscopy is one piece in this whole process to render a reliable uh, diagnosis for inherited platelet disorder. Yeah, you know, that's so interesting. We're still, um, you know, we're using uh, what is considered an older method, but such a, a valuable method, transmission electron microscopy, to really be able to see these tiny fragments of cells, these platelets, as you said, because you're right with our typical light microscopy. I, I see them all the time and they're just these little granular uh, pieces of material and it's hard to really evaluate them further. So platelet transmission electron microscopy, I'll just call it PTEM for short. Um, why is PTEM considered the gold standard for diagnosis? Excellent. As a pathologist, we have traditionally long time um, use morphology to diagnose disease. And then uh, this is probably also true uh, in some uh, practice area that Dr. Pritt, you practice, right? Mm -hmm. so you look at the morphology of the parasites and also their eggs trying to diagnose disease. We do the right. same. So in hematology, we use um, light microscopy to diagnose various uh, disorders. But unfortunately, light microscopy only give us at maximum 100x magnification. But since the platelets are so tiny, it still remain a little dot for us on the mm -hmm. sphere with the highest magnification by light microscopy. So we need something better for that. So EM provide a tremendous uh, 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 invaluable tool for us. For instance, the lowest EM magnification we use is 5,000 times magnification, that's lowest. Wow. We can go all the way up to 100,000 magnification if we want to. So therefore it gives us a tremendous resolution uh, to look at the infrastructure or ultrastructure of platelet. So in the platelet, we can see many granules. There are two kinds of a major granules. So alpha granule is a larger, it's contain many of the proteins that is a critical for platelet function. Dense granules contains calcium, phosphate. Those are important for uh, platelet function and also downstream secondary hemostasis. They trigger the uh, uh, clot formation. As you can see, their deficiency can cause platelet dysfunction and their deficiency, alpha granule or dense granule deficiency has been kind of a categorized in the disease entity called the platelet storage pool deficiency. So that is a, right now, to diagnose alpha granule deficiency and dense granule deficiency, is the uh, uh, EM is the gold standard uh, to verify that. Uh, um, and in addition, because of the high resolution, we can identify interesting abnormal inclusions, abnormal ultrastructure, such as uh, uh, very expanded uh, vascular, uh, no, not vascular, uh, vacuoles, and also some other inclusions in the white uh, in the platelets and also white cells and help us to diagnose various platelet, disorder, uh, platelet disorders. Uh, for instance, uh, Chadia Haigashi, the patient usually have a bleeding and also infection. So in their platelet, they usually have a zero dense granules. The normal range for uh, ordinary people, the dense granule is at least a two or one to one one point two to more than that, and then but in these patients they virtually have a zero dense granules. On top of that, if we look at the white cells, they have a very bizarre but unique 
cytoplasmic inclusions, the combination provide a distinct diagnosis or almost pathognomonic for uh, uh, Chade Kagashi uh, disease. For hermansky pollack syndrome, it's also very important and interesting test because for this particular patient population, they also uh, suffer from ocular albinism and also uh, platelet uh, dysfunction and bleeding. And then in their platelet, they don't have any dense granules, zero. So therefore wow. that provided a tremendous uh, uh, specificity and sensitivity of diagnosing hermansky pollack patients in a right pre-analytical clinical setting. So therefore, this has been becoming a gold standard uh, method for many of the well-classified or some uh, uh, recently recognized uh, rare platelet disorders. So this is a tremendously helpful uh, for us to actually uh, narrow down our diagnosis and then uh, diagnose uh, many patients. And then there has been a under uh, diagnosed platelet disorders appear to be underdiagnosed because we recently published our cohort. We found that the age of diagnosis of inherited platelet disorder were range at 30 to 40 years old. So therefore, there's a tremendous delay. We hope that the platelet EM associated with other esoteric testing, including clinical uh, assessment and also genetic testing, can help us to diagnose this patient earlier and then provide uh, uh, medical management earlier so that uh, to alleviate patient's bleeding and also potentially provide answer to many patients' questions that why am I bleeding? So I uh, hope I answered your question. Yeah, you did definitely, Dr. Chen. And it just really emphasizes the importance of basic morphology, which as a pathology just really warms my heart that you could look and see something like a basic structure, such as a dense granule. And it tells you so much about if they're completely absent, um, it can help point you in the right direction. So I'm really pleased that we are still using this morphologic method at such a high resolution, you know, as this gold standard. Now, like we said before, these are rare syndromes we're talking about. So access to testing is critically important. And you were really instrumental in bringing up this transmission electron microscopy test at Mayo Clinic. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Can you talk about the process, how you came to be involved and, um, and, and basically some of your work that led to this? Yeah, excellent uh, question. So uh, I've been uh, working on platelet rare disorders uh, for some time. So in 2007, we started evaluating um, using EM uh, on various platelet disorders in a research setting. And then at that time, we uh, usually recruit about 20 patients per year uh, trying to understand uh, uh, a platelet morphology using EM. And then, um, so we noticed that uh, dense granules actually uh, can be easily detected by EM using a technology called a hole mount. So what we do is that we basically use platelet-rich plasma. We uh, add that plasma, which contains platelet onto the grid, and then we just air dry it and then immediately put into the EM. The dense granule inside the platelet, actually they contain calcium and phosphate as we discussed, and then they block the electron beam. That blocking of electron beam create a forward shadow. That shadow is dense. So that's the reason why these granules historically has been called dense granules or dense core granules. So they are critical for obviously platelet function. And then hermansky pollack patients, they just don't have uh, that dense granule because of their mutations of the uh, granule genesis pathway. There are 11 forms. So we were really uh, in those days just doing our thing in research. And then uh, we were helped or collaborated with Dr. James White at the University of Minnesota. So he's a giant. He was a giant in platelet EM. Um, in a, of course, in a research laboratory, he has helped uh, uh, under, uh, research, try to understand many of the kind of the platelet EM abnormalities in various platelet disorder, and then including Hermansky-Pollack syndrome. In 2000, 
2012, actually, he decided to retire uh, after almost 40 years uh, of research career. And then definitely we uh, we were thinking, well, we're missing a, a giant in platelet research. But interestingly, uh, I was reached out by uh, Donna Appel, who is current the president of Hermansky Pollack Syndrome Patient Network. And then apparently, uh, Dr. James White uh, has been uh, in a research setting helping that uh, net patient network to diagnose or help research on the Hermansky Pollack Syndrome uh, in, the, uh, uh, in a research setting. So obviously, there's a, definitely a need uh, of taking care of this patient and then by providing a more reliable diagnosis by EM. So given that we discussed, we should actually bring this particular platelet EM test into the clinical laboratory so that actually we can generate a clinical report to patients rather than just a research study. So, and then we spend about two to three years to validate the test uh, with help of uh, Dr. James White. And then we, uh, the, we kind of uh, struggled with, at that time, multiple hurdles. Number one, there's a lack of standard process or SOP. There's a lack of a normal range of dense granule counts. Mm -hmm. And then there's an inconsistent granule interpretation. There were no proficiency testing available about this test. And then uh, we don't know the sample stability in all kinds of uh, anticoagulant uh, blood collection tubes. And then we don't know whether we can transport the sample. So all of the issues we need to address. So we spent about two to three years working with a, a brilliant team of uh, uh, experts and the technologists in our core platelet, uh, EM core facility at Mayo Clinic. And then finally we, uh, finalized and validated our assay. And then uh, we implement the test in 2015 in September. And then we also try to make sure uh, we share our experience with uh, the research community and also in the clinical laboratory community. So we published our study in a journal of platelet. And also we included a key information in the manuscript so that other people can learn from our experience and then may be able to implement a similar assay. So right now um, on the reference laboratory testing, uh, we appear uh, uh, to be, uh, I think the only one reference laboratory providing such a, a service. So we, um, we actually, uh, started uh, in 2015, our volume has grown significantly. Uh, when we started, we, uh, in a research setting before the test implement implementation, we do about 20 cases per year. Now we are about a thousand case per year. And now we also actively engage with a local hematologist and also with uh, NIH for their rare disease study program. So really we're learning from our uh, 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 physicians and also we're helping trying, uh, working together to help these patients. We also participate in, for instance, the Hermansi Pollack uh, Patient Network annual meetings, reporting to them our findings and also um, uh, working with them to kind of advocate uh, platelet testing. Because in our uh, experience, we're still observing a significant delay of this uh, diagnosis because of the age of the patient still somewhat in, uh, I would say it's improving, but still in a young adult kind of the age range. So we hope that we can reach out to patient earlier and more patients uh, and so that they can benefit from our service. Oh, well, it's really impressive, Dr. Chen. And I love how you're continuing to engage in the research community and then the patient community specifically, which is something that I think is very important for us as laboratorians is to have that patient connection as physicians, as pathologists as well. Now, you've touched on this a little bit, but um, I'm, I'll ask, 
these tests are very specialized. And of course, they're not needed routinely. Uh, it's great that we have this expertise to provide this testing. And now clearly your volumes have gone up substantially. And so that's great. Maybe we can help make these earlier diagnoses. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the, uh, why is it important to offer testing even for the rarest diseases? Yeah, so to us, uh, this is, um, um, we, uh, we actually have to thank Mayo Clinic. During our research and uh, also the test implementation, uh, the primary value of the Mayo patient uh, uh, first is actually always with us. And then for the rare disease, I have to say, even though it's a rare um, uh, for in general population, but it's not known, uh, nothing really rare for that patient and their family. Right. Then, yeah, I went to the uh, network, uh, Fermansky Potluck Network. Uh, the the whole hotel or the meeting place is full of these patients, and then they are uh, uh, brilliant uh, individuals, and then so we want to help them, and then despite their rare. It just uh, we have to help all the patients and also uh, try to understand uh, not only the diagnosis, but work with them, work with the NIH rare disease program uh, or underdiagnosed disease program and try to diagnose them earlier. And also end of the day, try to help them to find a treatment solution. So that's really what uh, uh, we, we strive for. And then it was actually a pretty straightforward a decision why we kind of uh, uh, launched on these validation. Uh, we had a clear need and then we have a, 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 a resource and then we have the expertise in our team. And then we decided let's go forward and then take care of this group of patients. So right now um, we're gaining experience. Uh, even though we started with a phone call and a request to diagnose Hermansky putlock syndrome, but our patient, in our patient cohort, we have taken care of many, many patients with different inherited platelet disorders. So as you can see that uh, gradually, given our volume, given our uh, kind of a consult uh, practice and also phone calls, we are helping a lot of patients. In my opinion, uh, the disease is, uh, is no longer rare. It's common mm. in our practice. So I'm glad that we can be part of the patient's journey that help them to render a diagnosis earlier. And then um, there has been uh, one uh, incident, I give you a story, that a patient actually uh, in his 40s came to Mayo for, um, for lung transplant because of the um, uh, pretty progressive, fast progressive pulmonary fibrosis. The patient looks a little bit uh, uh, albino and then uh, because we did a lot of advocates in Mayo Clinic. Uh, and then the uh, surgeon called me and asked me uh, if they should test for hermansky pollack syndrome because he uh, heard about the disease through our lectures. And then he was wondering about whether we should test for that. And lo and behold, we did the EM. We confirmed, yes, it is most likely hermansky pollack syndrome. And then we verified that by genetic testing, it was HPS1. And then uh, that is not, uh, not only we explained these patients uh, a reason for pulmonary fibrosis because HPS1 can directly cause downstream pulmonary fibrosis in these patients. Um, and then we also help the family because uh, uh, potentially there need to be a, a genetic counsel and for that family, just in case that uh, they need to be aware that they uh, could potentially benefit from uh, additional medical attention. Uh, what an inspiring story and inspiring work that you're doing. And I really appreciate you joining me today, Dr. Chen, to share these stories with me. Um, thank you again for being here and for all of the great work that you do for our patients. Thank you, Dr. Pritt, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday. <laughs>